This is going to be a study on the subject of mid-Acts dispensationalism. And the main thing we're going to talk about about what they believe is in Acts 9, they believe that when the Apostle Paul was saved, that he was the first person put into the body of Christ. Whereas unlike us, we believe that men began being put into the body of Christ in Acts chapter 2. So first we're going to talk about the phrase, in Christ. The phrase, in Christ. When you refute the position of the mid-Acts dispensationalists, the verse that is always used is Romans 16, 7. And you know, they'll say that we always use that verse, that that's all we got. But that's that's not all we got. It's just that the, we use this because it is the most simple and plain verse when it comes to going against their position. Because in Romans 16, 7, the Apostle Paul says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who were of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So he plainly says, the Apostle Paul, the one who was in Acts 9 and was saved on the road to Damascus, the one that they say was the first one in the body of Christ, he plainly says himself, someone was in Christ before him. And if someone was in Christ before Paul, then the body didn't start with Paul. The reason the verse is used over and over by Acts 2 dispensationalists is because it's so plain. But since you have this verse that plainly says people were in Christ before Paul, this forces mid-Acts dispensationalists to make in Christ refer to saints that aren't in the body of Christ. If in Christ, in Romans 16, 7, doesn't refer to Andronicus and Junia being in the body of Christ before Paul, then it goes against how Paul used the phrase in Christ through the rest of the chapter. So, I mean, that just, that settles it for me that that can't be right because he says all kinds of other people in the chapter are in Christ. So if you're mid-act dispensationalist, you would have to say that he used the phrase in Christ in that particular verse in Romans 16, 7 to refer to people who are in Christ but not in the body. But the rest of the chapter would use the phrase in Christ referring to people who are in the body. So you see how confusing it becomes. So you have to start kind of guessing around who, which one of these people are in the, were in the body and which one of these people were not in the body. Not to mention how Paul uses the phrase in Christ throughout his epistles. And it obviously refers to people who are in the body. In the body of Christ who are quickened, new creatures, justified, redeemed. Things that, char characteristics that have to do with people who are in the body of Christ. That's how he uses the phrase in Christ throughout his epistles. For example... 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. They also would like to use Ephesians 1, 10 to prove that in Christ doesn't necessarily mean in the body of Christ. Ephesians 1.10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Look at what it says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. How could you use this verse to override the 70 plus clear verses, which shows a person who is in Christ is obviously in the body of Christ. Because Ephesians 1.10 is referring to a future event in eternity. All things will eventually be gathered together in one. But right now, those who are in Christ are in the body. In Romans 16.7, Andronicus and Junia were in Christ in the body before Paul. And I mean, they also pull verses from Isaiah and Revelation to somehow prove that the men between the cross 
and the conversion of Paul are in Christ, but not in the body. And that's a stretch. In Isaiah 45, 17, it says, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. He shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. How, you know, if this is a event, ref, this is an event that takes place after the body has left the planet. So how are you going to say that this proves that Andronicus and Junia were in Christ, but not in the body of Christ? This is just taking things out of context here. In Revelation fourteen thirteen, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So they say, see here, this can't be referring to the body of Christ, which we know that. I mean, I'm not denying, I know that Revelation 14, 13 obviously is not referring to people who are in the body of Christ, yet it says that they're in the Lord. So obviously the people mentioned Revelation 14 and the nation of Israel aren't in the body, but is it honest Bible teaching to use these verses to prove that Andronicus and Junia and Romans 16, 7 weren't in the body when they were in Christ before Paul. Also, when Paul is using the phrase in Christ to, to refer to people who are in the body over and over again. And also right smack dab in the middle of one of the greatest epistles to the body. In the very epistle that lays out salvation so clearly for the church, which is his body, you have Paul saying in Romans 16, 7, that Andronicus and Junia were in Christ before him. Now, the people uh, that are saved in the tribulation and, and, and even in the Old Testament, Abraham was in the Lord, but he's not in the body of Christ. I believe that. I believe Abraham was in the Lord, but he wasn't in the body. The tribulation saints will be in the Lord but it's not going to be in the body of Christ like me and you are. But that doesn't mean you can take the verses that say that they're in the Lord and use that to say that Andronicus and Junia are in Christ but not in the body. That's just taking things out of context. Wouldn't it be dishonest and blow the context out of the water to say that Andronicus and Junia were in Christ, but not in the body. When everyone else in Romans 16, 7, who is said to be in Christ, was in the body. That's what I'm saying. I believe that's twisting things. And they've, they've seen that Romans 16, 7 by itself disproves their position. So they have to twist it around and make it. Romans 16, 7, where it says in Christ, they have to make that refer to people who are in Christ but not in the body when it refers to people who are in Christ and in the body. Because, I mean, that traps them there. In Romans 12, 5, it says, So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members of another. I mean, it's over and over. When Paul uses that in Christ, he's referring to people who are in the body. He did it in Romans 12, 5. He does it throughout his epistles. In Ephesians 3, 1 through 6, it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ, in Christ by the gospel. So the mysteries for the church were revealed to Paul, but this doesn't mean that the body had to start with Paul. Now, let's look at the subject of how Paul persecuted the church. And as they say, another common rebuttal that we have against them is, 
how Paul is said to persecute the church. And a mid-ex dispensationalist might say we always use the same verses, but that is because these verses are so clear on the topic and they easily refute their teaching. Don't let the fact that they say that we use the same verses over and over again intimidate you out of using those verses. Those verses are in the Bible, and you can use them against them if they plainly go against their teaching. It doesn't matter if you use the same verses over and over again or not. I mean, we use the same verses over and over again against other false beliefs. Just because we use the same ones over and over again doesn't mean we have to come up with new ones to go against them. We just use them because these are the most plain ones. In Galatians 1, 13 and 14, it says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. A mid acts dispensationalist might say, you can't waste the church, which is his body. So therefore, when Paul says, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, he has to be referring to a local church and not the body. So to the mid acts dispensationalist, when Paul says, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, it doesn't disprove his position because Paul's not saying he persecuted the body of Christ. He's saying he persecuted a local church. However, look at Galatians 1.14. The very next verse, after he said, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, Paul said, I profited in the Jews' religion. How do you profit in the Jews' religion? Through physical things. As a Pharisee, he was focused on a physical kingdom of heaven. And as it says in Matthew eleven twelve, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. When he was persecuting Christians that made up the church of God, in his mind, in that sense, he was wasting it. Paul was physically hurting Christians in their physical bodies, but these were people that were a part of a spiritual body the church of God. The church is made up of every born-again believer, and the church is his body. In Colossians 1.24, it says, And who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. So obviously, you can't kill the body of Christ. You can't waste the body of Christ. But Paul was referring into the sense of, in the Jews' religion, which was about physical things, not spiritual things. When Paul was in the Jews' religion, he was focusing on things of the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. So when he was killing Christians, in that sense, he was persecuting the church of God and wasting it. Also consider how that when Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, he said, Why persecutest thou me? Paul was persecuting Jesus Christ in Acts 7 and 8, even though Jesus Christ was in the third heaven. How was he doing this? By persecuting the church of God and wasting it. He was torturing physical people that were a part of a spiritual body. By doing so, Jesus Christ said himself that he was persecuting him. It says in Acts 9, 4, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Of course you had the church in the wilderness. And that's not the body of Christ. You have churches in the tribulation that aren't the body of Christ. You have local churches like the church of Corinth. That's referring to a local assembly. But there is the church which is his body. And in Colossians 1.24 it says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ for my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. So there are times when the church refers to the body of Christ. And when Paul says, How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, 
we believe he's referring to the body of Christ and not just local churches. So the, the faith that people needed to be put into the body of Christ was there before Paul got the faith himself. And in the same chapter in Galatians chapter 1, 21 through 24, it says, Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. So in the same chapter, it says he preached the faith. So after he was saved, he was preaching the faith which once he destroyed. If he was preaching something completely different, then why is he preaching the faith that he once destroyed? You see what I mean? Obviously, people had the faith that you needed to be put in the body before Paul got the faith. He's now preaching the faith that he was destroying. Paul was preaching the faith which once he destroyed. If Paul was preaching something different than what was being preached before he showed up, then why does it say... He is preaching the faith which once he destroyed. And it says this after, a few verses after it says he persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Now there he's speaking in the sense of physically persecuting the church of God and wasted it. Because before his conversion, his mind was on that physical kingdom of heaven. Profiting in the Jews' religion, physical things. It was about physical things, not spiritual things. Now, the next thing is water baptism. A portion of mid-Acts dispensationalists teach that you shouldn't get water baptized because, because Paul was sent not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, I know some of them don't, you know, make a big deal about it, but some other ones, they say that, I mean, they borderline think it's a sin to get water baptized. And there are some that believe that. Not all of them, obviously. And obviously you can't just take certain mid-acts dispensationalists and use what they teach to teach against all of them. That's not fair. But a lot of them do just outright teach against water baptism to the point that they believe it's wrong or a sin to, to do. But keep in mind, it doesn't say anywhere not to be water baptized. Keep that in mind. In 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 12, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. And while I don't believe that mid-acts dispensationalists necessarily want division, but that is exactly what what their teaching brings is division. It says, And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. The mid-acts dispensationalists, it brings a lot of contention. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Now keep in mind in 1 Corinthians 1, the context is about these saints having divisions and contentions. They were saying, I am of Paul. Another was saying, I am of Apollos. This gives the explanation of why Paul says what he says in the next few verses. He says in verses 13 and 14, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. And Gaius. So he's glad that he hasn't baptized any of them. That way they can't glory in being baptized by him. They can't say, well, I'm, I was baptized by Paul. Many people may glory in the fact that they sit under a certain preacher and they think they're more special or spiritual for that reason. And they were divided over these things. And he goes on to say in verse 15 through 17, Lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. But then he says, And I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. 
For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So Paul isn't teaching against water baptism here. Some mid act dispensationalists, not all of them, obviously, but some of them teach that since Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, they say, Well, see here, Paul doesn't believe in water baptism. I mean, but that's that's not what the chapter's talking about. That's not what the context is talking about. I don't believe Paul is preaching against water baptism here. And to be balanced, I don't believe that he is requiring it here. But there is no need to teach against water baptism, which that is what they do. They may not do that directly. Maybe at times they'll do that indirectly. They'll teach against water baptism. Just because it says Paul was sent not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And of course, this shows us water baptism is not part of the gospel. And this is a great proof against the Church of Christ who believe that you have to be water baptized to be saved, which we don't believe that either. But it shows that water baptism is not the main thing. It shows that we shouldn't fuss about it. Because if it's not part of the gospel, obviously it's has nothing to do with your salvation. At the same time, I don't think you can use these verses to preach against water baptism. Paul never said it was wrong to be water baptized. Also, the fact that Paul said himself here, he baptized Crispus and Gaius in the household of Stephanus. Paul himself was baptized. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And Christ himself was baptized. Obviously, Paul, uh, Paul and Jesus Christ weren't baptized for the reason that you are. But the fact that he's water baptized, and the fact that he baptized people after he was saved, he was baptized himself, and all kinds of other people in the book of Acts were baptized after they were saved. I mean, this kind of gives you a pattern that maybe you ought to get water baptized after you're saved. So what's the point of water baptism? It's something you do after you have believed the gospel. It shows the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, why do you have to do it if you are already saved? Well, I mean, why do you have to do anything after you're saved? I just believe it's good and right to get baptized. That's my belief on the on this. I can't find anywhere that Paul requires it, just comes out and says you must be water baptized after you're saved. I mean, I got baptized for conscience sake. My conscience bothered me until I did. As it says in 1 Peter 3.21, the like figure, notice it's a figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, so it's the answer of a good conscience. I personally got baptized for conscience sake. You know, it shows something visibly that took place invisibly. When you're standing in the water, your body uh, and the water make the shape of a cross. Then you're buried with them when you go under the water. And then you rise with him when you come up out of the water. That is a picture of what took place inside. It's not for salvation. And it doesn't even prove you're saved. If Paul was living today, I believe he would be water baptized for the same reason we are. For the same reason he circumcised Timothy. In Acts 16.3 it says, Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. If baptism isn't wrong, it's not wrong. You can't find where water baptism, where it's wrong to get water baptized. If it's not wrong, and today you have the majority of Bible believers, they believe you ought to get water baptized after your conversion, then why not just go ahead and get water baptized? I would never look down on anyone for not being water baptized. I really wouldn't. I would still fellowship with that person. 
I can't find where you have to be baptized in water to be a member of a local church. I don't even see like church membership as in a local church in the Bible at all. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't require a man to have every single conviction I have to be in fellowship with me. I personally don't see an unbaptized Christian as someone that I should mark and avoid or to have no fellowship with. It's nothing like Paul saying not to company with fornicators or to withdraw myself from. I just believe a man ought to get water baptized after he's saved. I think that's the best thing for that topic to do. Jesus was baptized. Paul was baptized. All the saints in the New Testament were baptized. Even most of the mid-Acts dispensationalists have been water baptized because many of them came out of a Baptist church. So I just can't comprehend why any of them would pretty much preach against being water baptized and being a Baptist. And if they don't want to get water baptized, that's between them and the Lord. But if they preach against it, then that is something different. I believe that's taking it a little bit too far. If Jesus was baptized... Paul was baptized. Paul baptized others. Men were baptized throughout the book of Acts. And there is nothing against water baptism. Then how do we come to the conclusion that we should not be water baptized, period? I believe that's unbalanced, personally. And I believe it's crazy to pretty much come out of the Baptist church for the reason of you don't believe a person should be water baptized after salvation. And whether they're doing it directly or indirectly, by consistently teaching against water baptism, borderline making people feel guilty for being a Baptist and being water baptized, that causes contention and division. It and it pulls people out of Bible-believing Baptist churches. It does, because it makes people think, well, the Baptist church is completely off on this thing that they really believe about water baptism. And then those people leave the Baptist church and join the mid-Acts dispensationalist-type churches. And I think that's the biggest problem with this. Now, I personally, I, I don't think that the Mid-Acts Dispensationalist is nowhere near as as bad as a lot of Bible-believing Dispensationalists make it out to be. I don't believe it's a cult. I don't believe that they're heretics. I don't believe that they teach a false gospel. I certainly don't lump it up with the Church of Christ and Calvinists and Mormons and stuff like that like a lot of Bible believers do. I mean, I think the Mid-Ax Dispensationalist guys are, many of them that I listened to here recently are sincere. They have the right gospel. I believe they love the Bible. And I believe they're sharp in the Bible. And just because I believe they're wrong on this topic, this doesn't believe, mean I think I know more Bible than they do. They probably know more Bible than me. But I think that what they're teaching here is they got to twist a lot of things around. They got to stretch some things. But that's what I believe about water baptism. Now, if you are a Christian, you don't believe water baptism. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to look down on you. I wouldn't break fellowship with you over it. I personally believe for this reason, I mean, Jesus was baptized Paul was baptized. Paul baptized other people. People were getting baptized throughout the book of Acts after they were saved. So that brings me to the conclusion that I should get water baptized after I'm saved. Not to get saved, not to stay saved, not to think I'm more spiritual because of it. And I, a lot of them believe that they're more spiritual for not getting water baptized. They believe they're more spiritual than us, but a lot of them don't believe that. I've I heard a, th some of them say that, you know, water baptism isn't wrong. It's a, it's a conscience thing. I have heard them say that. So not all these people are just closed-minded people. 
And you shouldn't look down on them. Those are your brothers and sisters in Christ too. And I mean, I listen to some of them and I can learn from them and get good things from them. I just personally disagree with them on this, on these beliefs that they have. Now, the next thing, last thing we're going to talk about is when did the body of Christ start? Well, in Ephesians 2.16, it says that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So the way into the body of Christ was made possible by the cross. Men began getting into the body in Acts 2. In Acts 1.5, it says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. In Acts 2, 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So I believe that men began to be baptized into the body of Christ in Acts chapter 2, where it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I, that's what I believe. I believe that's the most logical place to say that they started being put into the body of Christ I mean, the, it was made possible to get in there by the cross. And I believe the most logical place to put them being put into the body is in Acts chapter 2. Now, obviously, you got some strange and different things taking place in Acts chap in the book of Acts because it's a transition book. And obviously, things aren't happening just like they are today in the book of Acts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it shows us the spirit baptism. This has nothing to do with water baptism. It's the, it's the only baptism which saves. It says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. That's the spirit baptism. That's what they experienced in Acts chapter 2. They were baptized into the body of Christ, where it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. But in the chapter before that, in Acts 1, 5, it says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. It wasn't, with, it wasn't referring to a water baptism. It's the Holy Spirit baptism. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. The reason the book of Acts is so strange to us is because it was a transition from the Jews to the church. And if the Jews would have received Jesus Christ, then the church would have never come about. But the fact is that they didn't receive him. And it isn't just in Acts 2 that you see differences in operation, but also throughout the entire book of Acts. And I'm well aware that what took place in Acts 2.38 is not something we do today. I'm aware that things were different in the book of Acts. As I'm sure you know, Paul calls the church the body, as we've already said. Like in Colossians 1.24, he calls the church the body of Christ. And look what it says at the end of Acts 2. In Acts 2.47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice it is the Lord adding them to the church. Now, I know the Mid-Acts Dispensationalists would say this is just a local church, not the church which is his body. But I mean, I personally believe it's the church which is his body. He's add the Lord is adding to the church daily such as should be saved. It's the Lord adding them to the church. Also consider how they are preaching the gospel before Paul is converted in Acts chapter 9. In Acts three fourteen through 16, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. In his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So, I mean, they're preaching the faith. Paul was destroying this faith as a lost Pharisee. And Paul preaches this same gospel after his conversion. So the gospel that was, that's needed 
to be believed to be put into the body was being preached before Paul. People were being added to the church before Paul. And I know they believe that's not the body of Christ. They believe that's just a local church. But it said the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It says they were baptized with the Holy Ghost. So the Mid-Acts Dispensationalist has to make two spirit baptisms. And I, I personally don't see how you can just say that there's two spirit baptisms just so that you can make the spirit baptism in Acts 2 not be the same as the one in 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. That's what you have to do. But what does it take for a man to be baptized into the body of Christ? Believing on Jesus Christ. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, what happens? You're put into the body of Christ. That's what they were preaching before Paul's conversion. If the way of the body, way to get into the body of Christ, was made possible by the cross, and men were baptized by the Holy, with the Holy Ghost in Acts 2, then why would you say that these people aren't put into the body of Christ? In Acts 4, 1 through 4, it says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. While Peter, obviously, and the rest of them didn't have everything figured out, and the church age mysteries weren't revealed until Paul, it doesn't cancel out the fact that men were being put into the body of Christ before Paul. Jesus Christ made it possible at the cross for men to be put in the body, and the gospel, which is required to be put in the body, which is required to be believed to be put in the body, was preached before Paul. How could you say they weren't put in the body? The gospel was being preached. It says the men believed. And then in Acts 4.10, it says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And then in Acts 4.12, neither, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So, I mean, they're preaching the same gospel that Paul preaches. And in Acts chapter 8, Philip preaches Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. This is before Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. He's preaching Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch using Isaiah 53. And he believes... The Ethiopian eunuch believes. He says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he's water baptized afterwards. It says in Acts 8, 35 through 39, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and, went, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they were come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went away rejoicing. So Philip preached Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch believed and was water baptized after he believed. I mean, that's that's plain that you got what what happens today was taking place before Paul. I mean, it's not exactly the same. Everything's not exactly the same because, as we know, and as even the Mid Acts dispensationalists know, the Book of Acts is a transitional book. But this takes place before Paul's conversion. So the Mid-Acts dispensationists would believe that the eunuch wasn't in the body of Christ. They believe he was in Christ, but not in the body of Christ, since the mystery of the body wasn't revealed until Paul got saved. 
Now, even though the body was there to get into, to get into because Jesus Christ made it possible by the cross, they still wouldn't believe that the Ethiopian eunuch was in the body. Even though the Ethiopian eunuch believed the gospel that you yourself trusted in to be put into the body today. So what the what they're saying is, since the the mystery of the body wasn't revealed until Paul, they'll say none of the people before Paul were put in the body. Now I don't believe that. Just because it hasn't been revealed yet of the mysteries of the body, this doesn't mean they weren't put in the body. Because I mean the gospel that you believe to be put in the body was there before Paul. I don't have to believe, I don't have to understand all the mysteries, all of Paul's mysteries to be saved. I mean, when I got saved, I didn't understand anything about Paul. I knew Jesus Christ died. He shed his blood. He died for me. He was buried. He died for my sins. He rose again. I believed all that. That that's what got me into the body of Christ. It wasn't until after I was saved that I learned about that Paul was the apostle for me. <clears throat> While Acts is a tough book with so many changes and transitions, to me, Acts 2 is the most logical place for people to begin being put in the body. And I mean, Acts 6, 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. They believed. They believed that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. Just like me and you, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're put into the body of Christ. This is why I believe people were put into the body of Christ before Paul. I mean, I'm not some great Bible scholar. I don't believe I have all the answers. But I mean, I believe it's pretty clear that even though Acts is a transition book, different things are happening in the book of Acts than they happen today, obviously. And things in Acts 1 through 8 are obviously different than how they happen today, but this doesn't mean that just because they didn't understand that the they didn't understand the mysteries of Paul or they hadn't been revealed before Paul doesn't mean they weren't put into the body of Christ before Paul came preaching about the body. And I mean, this is a, this is just, I, I mean, I, I hate even doing this, this topic because it can be so confusing, especially about the things like the phrase in Christ, because in Romans 16, seven to prove their position they have to make Andronicus and Junia be in Christ but not in the body when everybody in Romans 16 is said to be in Christ and they are in the body. But they they see, you know, they, they get a hold of like Acts 2 dispensationalist books and they see that they the uh, Acts 2 dispensationalists have proved that the body of Christ did not begin with Paul and they have to twist the verses to prove their position because they see that the position has been refuted. And that's what they've done. And they just have to keep, they get, they act, it seems like they're getting closer to the Bible believing position. And I'm not, by saying that, I'm not saying they don't believe the Bible. What I'm saying is they're getting closer to the right thing because they keep having to adjust what they believe. And because it's being refuted so much. That's why if you, if you listen to them and then you come back five years later, you listen to them again, then they've perfected some things. I mean, it seems like to me they're getting closer to the right thing, but they still got to twist verses like Romans 16, 7 and make it be in Christ but not in the body. I mean, that's awfully convenient to be able to just say, well, those people were in Christ, but they weren't in the body. How do you get that? I don't see how you get that. But this has been my honest belief about the mid-acts dispensationalism. I did a, uh, 
a study against hyperdispensationalism years ago, and I, I've come to, come to the conclusion that I don't like to refer to them as hyperdispensationalists, just because they are more dispensational than I am. I don't I don't want to do that. I after listening to them, they seem more sincere than they're made out to be. You know, people make them out to be just horrible people. I don't believe that they're horrible people. I believe they're Christians in the body of Christ, just like me and you. I would never down them or break fellowship. I don't think that being a mid acts dispensationalist is something that you have a right to break fellowship with somebody over. And then by saying that, I make all the Acts 2 dispensationalists mad, but I don't care. But this has been a study on mid acts dispensationalism.